What's going on, everybody? Leo Cannell here with today's Seven Figures Club podcast. Today we have an author, a speaker, an entrepreneur who's going to really, you know, show you how to take your business to that Seven Figures Club, getting the top five percent of businesses. Today we have the lovely Molly McGrath. Now, since the late '90s, even though it looks like I mean, she must have been doing this, you know, when she was a teenager because <laughs> she doesn't look that old. But Molly has coached, consulted, and directed presidents and founders of national organizations in over 4,000 law firms. That's a lot of attorneys she's been helping in executive level leadership, continuous improvement, and team empowerment initiatives to infiltrate new markets, leveraging partner ecosystems and producing profitability. She has 25 years of specific skill set experience serving as a fractional CEO, CMO, marketing fractional CEO, conversation intelligence coaching, team development and leadership employee empowerment, entrepreneur talent acquisition, uh, Kaizen leadership, root cause analysis, revenue mapping and action based project management. Wow, Molly, you've done a lot. Welcome to the show. There are over 32 million businesses in the US and over 90% of them will never break seven figures in annual sales. So how do we as entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs break into that seven figures club? This podcast will relentlessly share the secrets, strategies, and tactics I've used to create three multi-seven figures businesses and bring in even more successful entrepreneurs than me to share their inspirational stories and tactics to success. You can create your dream business in life right now. So buckle up and let's go. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. So we always like to kind of begin these podcasts by learning just a little bit about your background as an entrepreneur and, and what, who, I guess, who was Molly, you know, growing up in the high school years and what experiences do you think led you to more independence, freedom, entrepreneurial type thinking? Mm. Oh gosh. You know, I wish I could say it was intentional. It was my mission to own my own headaches. I mean, business and to, you know, that was, I was born That's entrepreneur. No, that was not the case. I like to say, you know, my greatest blessing is my greatest curse to some extent of I'm a two on the Enneagram. If anyone's familiar with that, I'm a caretaker. I am. When I was little, people would constantly say jeepers. This feels like a Spanish inquisition. Stop with all the questions, you know, way beyond being five years old when I'd be like, why, 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 why? I was always deeply, deeply and curious. And I think that's what makes me a phenomenal coach and leader is my ability to be deeply invested and curious and really be able to sit in the perspective of an employer and an employer because I was an employee at one time. And what got me here um, was I really went started. I left Buffalo, New York when I was 27 years old and moved to Colorado. I had in my contract, I worked in city government. I could take a year of personal leave absence and come back and have my job. So there was definitely a back door and absolutely a safety net. So, you know, being the risk taker that entrepreneurs are, I really wouldn't say that was my motivation and my driving force in the beginning. And I got a job in Denver here for three weeks and resigned and didn't use my whole year uh, leave absence that I could have. And I was fortunate enough to belong to a national training organization that was very, very specific to estate planning and elder law attorneys. And I knew nothing about attorneys other than you should go to school and be a doctor or a lawyer. And thankfully at 27 years old, I had never interacted with a lawyer. So uh, the only thing I knew was that they're wicked, smart, super successful, you know, guaranteed seven figures coming out of law school and you should be intimidated. Well, I get a job and I go to, we had legal conferences every 90 days around the country. And back then that organization hired a coach and started in one of the very first attorney coaching programs. Well, I had no exposure to coaching at 27 years old. I didn't even know who Tony Robbins was, Jim Rohn, any of these people that, uh, that my coach was speaking about in this coaching room. 
And it's fascinating because people would step up to the mic, what's working, what's not working, what's your biggest frustration, all the things. And the common theme with the 77 law firms across the country that were in this conference room in San Diego, that they kept saying the common theme was business would be great, but for the employees. And I would hear this over and over and over again. And then we'd go to the cocktail reception or the coffee breaks or what have you. And the employees would be there and they'd be like, God, my job would be great. But for my employer, they're a control freak. They don't delegate. We never can get time, attention and feedback from them, et cetera. So I really, my deep curiosity is what landed me into entrepreneurship. So I just started asking questions, finding out what the root cause was all of this and realizing they both wanted the same thing. They just weren't speaking the same language. So I went to the head of the organization and said, I need to start a team training program. It's great that all these entrepreneurs and these lawyers are getting training, but there's a massive disconnect. There's absolutely no training or coaching for the employees. It's like, well, okay, who's going to sign up for this? Sure. Try it. And it was wildly successful. Then everyone's like, you should write a book. Oh, can we hire you for coaching? And I really, that's where my started my own business. Unbelievable. What a great story. So, and I, you talk about entrepreneurs always taking these obscene risks, but I think a lot, the more I learn about entrepreneurship and those who succeed is they really do everything possible to limit and reduce that risk as much as possible, put the odds in their favor you know, not maybe have that job, do it on the side until they can get there. I think it's Sarah Blakely with Spanx, who started Mm. that uh, company Mm. kind of on the side, still had her W2 job for years until she went full time with it. I think a lot of people, you know, get smart and do it that way. One thing that strikes me about what you're talking about here is asking questions. What is it specifically about asking questions, asking the right questions? And really taking time to figure things out that a lot of entrepreneurs, you know, don't do. And and maybe we're just, we just want to jump in and grind and get to work, but we forget to ask questions. And it sounds like you identified a massive issue of, you know, employers and employees not asking the right questions. Or asking any questions at all. Any questions at all. I love this question, whether it's an employee or the employer. I don't think we hold space or give people permission to ask the questions. You know, any once human beings understand the beginning, the middle, the end, and the why, and the why is so important, that's when you can get it into your bones and blood, and then it doesn't become a one-hit wonder. Because if you don't understand the why of why I'm telling you to do something or asking you to do something, or why I want to deploy this new strategy or what have you. If you're not really clear on the why, and you know, Simon Sinek talks about that all the time and making certain it's in alignment with you and it feels good for you. And it is like a hell yes, you know, and it's a resounding in your bones, whether you're the employer or the employee, then it's just going to become a fleeting moment. There's no lack of strategy out there, especially in this day and age online in the digital age, all of us have the strategy of how to make seven figures. We all have this strategy of how to do whatever it is that we're trying to accomplish, triple our leads, double our revenue, whatever it might be. But when you understand why you're being told this is the secret sauce, this is strategy and how it resonates with your personality, your tonality, your culture and your business, then it's not going to have any lasting power to it. And the same thing with employees. I coach my employees and my clients that hire me to, to have their employees constantly ask why like a five-year-old to figure out, because when you understand that, then you can come to people with a proposed solution, especially employees. We believe, all right, this entrepreneur, we all, we all have this story in our head. Business owners are just rolling in the dough. They have all the answers in the world to everything and anything. Otherwise you must be successful. How could you own a business? Well, a lot of times the entrepreneur is secretly like, why is everybody always coming to me for the answer? 
does somebody else have, can somebody come to me with a proposed solution and or an answer? And we are all secretly waiting and depending on our employees and the people that we work with and surround ourselves to come to us with some insight and feedback. But employees are taught, keep your mouth shut, put your head down and do what you're told. And it takes me forever to really work on unpacking that and breaking down those limiting beliefs that they have from past employers or whatever they were told when they were employee that, you know, just the boss is the boss. But that's not how my experience, most entrepreneurs actually want employees that will step up and lead, that have an opinion, that come to them with proposed solutions, that say to them, hey, why are we doing it this way? Can't we cut out this, 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 or can't we add this, or can't we automate this to make it more efficient and effective and impact the bottom line in the client experience? What employer wouldn't love for somebody to come to them and say that? Oh, I would sure love it because there's three types of people in this world, Molly, right? We got uh, those who are really good at uh, finding problems, the worst type, those that make them and very few that solve them. And Mm. if we had more employees coming to us with solutions, that's exactly what we want to encourage. But as you started this business, it started as an idea, a curiosity. Why are employers and employees having this disconnect? Why can't they get on the same page? What are some of the steps that entrepreneurs and managers should be taking to be able to connect with their employees, help them understand the why? Is this something that should be done in a weekly meeting? Is this an individual thing, like a one-on-one thing? Like, what are some of the steps that entrepreneurs, business owners, managers should be taking to get their employees to understand why they're doing things? And more importantly, like, I'm, I'm wondering how many employers actually dig for the why of why there are employees even there, right? What's driving them? Mm. You know, I think it, it starts at the hiring process. So if you are in the hiring process or when you do get back into the hiring process, start there. You, I always interview people from a place of really figuring out how confident they are and how willing they are to use their voice. Because we can all say, everybody says it, we have an open door policy. You know, we have a culture of communication and all these buzzwords that they find at TJ Maxx home on these plaques and hang them on their wall and think that that's, they, they can check the box that they have culture. But that in my experience, when I do the interviewing process, I will have either if I'm representing my client or I'm in the Zoom room with my client, like paint the picture of the day to day. I'm an entrepreneur. I have the attention span of a bed bug. I am consistently blowing off deadlines and meetings. I'm the biggest bottleneck. Everybody's delegating back up to me, what have you, when I'm missing my deadlines and I'm late, consistently late for client meetings and all the things that you know are occurring that you need this new employee to fix. Tell me how you're going to fix it and then be quiet. And allow for them when I tell you, you know, there it is and be quiet and be still and allow for them to paint the picture of how they're going to support you for people that have existing employees in place. I would really say these are the frame created like we all love systems. We all love process. EOS is all the buzzword uh, uh, these days. So we really want to make certain that we, we create a framework for communication with our employees and checking in and doing a weekly well check with them. So yes, I do say have a weekly stakeholders mm-hmm. meeting and call it a stakeholders. Everybody right down to the receptionist is a stakeholder within this business. That's, you know, the definition of an entrepreneur. You use words like our client, you use words like we missed a deadline. You know, you hear all there is no I in team, but you can really see it because your employees do lose sleep over the clients, over the calendar, over cash flow, over the life cycle of a file. So I say have a weekly meeting, stakeholders meeting where it's an agenda. It's not ran by you. You empower somebody else on your team and you are checking in. Of course, you have your reporting, you're tracking your measurements, your KPIs, your ROIs, all that jazz. But you're also checking in with people on what are your top three for the week? 
Where do you anticipate getting jammed up? Where did you get jammed up last week? Where do you need help? What's not working for you today? What's the one thing that you really need that you're not seeing right now to set you up for success? So you're creating that, but it's not just lip service where you're actually following up on it last from last week. Okay, great. How'd you do? And you're making certain that when they tell you that you're not defending or justifying it, but you're really doing something to really pivot and to make a change for that. I also have somebody doesn't have to be the business owner, depending on the size of your company, having a weekly or daily huddle, treating it like a military stand-up meeting. And then uh, lastly, my clients will do a quarterly employee growth plan. They're not waiting annually mm. to do reviews and they're not calling them reviews anymore because they feel very one-sided and heavy and hard and not very empowering and exciting. So where the employee does a self-evaluation, again, you have to give people permission to speak their truth, but not weaponize it and use it as a weapon against them or uh, get defensive or justify why things are the way they are. Again, get really still and quiet. So the deep curiosity coupled with the silence in the space, and then also finding the solution and treating it as coaching versus justification and judgment. Great, great points there. So, so talking about the importance of some weekly meetings, empowering others to run it, asking questions and, and being, you know, able to just sit back, shut up as, as the boss and just listen. And they're going to tell you so many important things. And one thing I really want the audience to pay attention to is the importance of quarterly meetings, because that's something that, uh, that we started uh, doing within the last year. And as we started to meet with our, our employees and team on a quarterly basis, like I, I think more than anything, it just seems to show them that you care, that, that you really want to get to know them and what's driving them, what is their why, what are their goals? Because when you understand their goals and then the goals that you set for them and, and you know, together, now we're going to help achieve the life they want, the career they want, they're going to empower them. And, and the, the education, you know, what you can provide to them, uh, amazing things. Now, one of the things you talk a lot about is kind of the permission to break down, pause, break through and, and grow, you know, how, unpack that for us. What, what are some of the keys to understanding permission to break down, pause, break through and grow? Yeah. So I, I think that's the greatest foundation that a lot of people miss is really creating their permission standards. You know, I think people just put it on, you know, their, their, their house rules of engagement, so to speak. And then it lives on a shelf. It has to stay off the shelf and seeing what we're doing and how we're doing with that consistently. So making certain you're really clear on your permission standards and what those are for you. You know, we do have honest, well, respectful conversations in real time. Well, how are we doing with that? That's the pause and really figuring out of where we're having um, breakdowns. You know, one of strategic coach, a phenomenal coaching program out of Toronto that I first, my very first coaching program I got exposed to um, really speaks heavily about this um, exercise called frustration breakthroughs. And it's so true. So many people see frustration as a negative and behind every breakdown if you can shift your mindset is a breakthrough. So it's not about shame or blame or finger pointing at all. And I think a lot of times people don't want to highlight the breakdown because they feel like there's always somebody at the front of that. There's somebody at the driving force of that and really taking it from a place again of deep curiosity and checking in on that and making certain that we're using it as an opportunity for growth versus again, throwing people under the bus is a phrase that I hear all the time. Mm, no question. So break when there's a breakdown, there's an opportunity for a breakthrough. I almost feel like it's when, you know, you had the angry customer or client or strategic partner, and we actually take the time to listen. They will tell you oftentimes something that's, that's broken, that needs to be fixed. And, and it's the same thing with your team. There's a breakdown somewhere 
there's an opportunity for a breakthrough and to fix it. Now, one of the issues that I know a lot of you know entrepreneurs and business owners that listen to this podcast or are looking for guidance with is obviously as a business owner, your blood, sweat, and tears are everywhere in the business, and you take ownership of everything because it's it's you know your blood, sweat, and tears, your money maybe that you're putting on the line there and 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 future. But how do you? you know, create an environment, a culture where your team, where your employees also, you know, fill this, uh, this need to take ownership of a project, uh, of a customer, of a client. How do you create an atmosphere where that can take place? Because that is the difference, I think, between the greatest companies out there, you know, that Jim Collins talks about and from good to great and yes. those that never get there. Yeah, I just was thinking when you said that, like I love in that book when he talks about the health of an every organization is your ability to have the fist pounding conversations. And, you know, I, yes. I, 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 you may be surprised to hear this, but I hear from employees all the time and I have for 26 years and counting now is that I can't care more about the business than the business owner does. And I'm like, what? This is fascinating to me. And I'll tell you why. This is where it starts. Vulnerability and transparency. I think that we think as business owners, we don't want to freak our employees out if we don't know the answer. We don't want to freak our employees out if we're worried about cash flow or if the client is upset or what have you. I think the quicker and the sooner and more often that you can get very vulnerable and transparent with them is that how much they will actually care as much, if not more than you. And then making certain that you are consistently having those safety net meetings there for you. So when we do have a breakdown, we are, we are stressed out because of money. Now, do you have to come and open up your PL and share it with the team? No, but how do you, in my experience, if you f- fix your people and you fix your process and you fix your production, you fix your profitability because so go the calendar, so go your to-do list, so go cash flow. period, end of story. So, so often the employers, business owners don't share with the client and there's just this thundering silence. They can feel, they can feel your stress. They can see, but we don't want to freak them out where we think, well, what are they going to do about it? They have no control over it. It's my thing. My name's on the building. Why would they care? And they do care with their part. So when they're really clear on the value that they create in their position, I always fight with business owners every single day. I'm like, you're the least important person in the building. Honestly, the first and most important person is a receptionist person that's answering your phone, they'll say, well, how does she impact cash flow? How does she impact KPIs? What have you, he or she? And when I break it down into what their key performance indicators are, it's like, they don't do your job. You have no sales call to meet with. You have no prospective client to meet with because they're a director of first impressions right there. So, you know, as much as possible that you can get really real, like guys, I'm frustrated. I'm upset that we keep getting these consistent client complaints that we've dropped the ball on X, Y, and Z, that we're not closing deals. We're not closing files, what have you. And to your point, that's when you do a workshop, you do a retreat, but it's all in your tonality and your deliverability and your commitment to be part of the solution. I think so often the way it lands for employees is that my employers just constantly frustrated, constantly stressed out. Nothing's good enough. Their expectations are so high. They have no appreciation for what it takes to do my job for a seat that they've never sat in. And so why bother, so to speak? And then on the flip side, like you just painted for the business owner, when you have that power of the pause and you take the time to stop, drop and roll, what do they say on the plane? You know, put the oxygen mask on yourself before assisting others. If you can get in a room and just brainstorm it and just workshop it, and it's okay to say these are all the things, because this is the greatest, the coolest thing I ever see time and time and time and time again. When a business owner gets in a room and they're like, guys, 
I am waking up at two o'clock in the morning. I'm not sleeping. I'm bringing the stressed out crappy version home to my kids and my family. And I come home and they're frustrated with me. And then I come here and I'm failing with you guys. I know you can see all my frustration and what have you. Let's just take the junk drawer, dump it on the proverbial dining room table, all of it. Let's get it all out and let's figure out how we can turn this thing around right there. Your employees will take a bullet for you. They will take on four times the work and not even ask for a raise because now they understand your commitment and your vision to this thing. I think so often when we walk around trying to you know, keep it at bay, keep it at bay, keep it at bay. They're experiencing our energy, number one. And then number two, we're freaking them out because they're like, we don't know if this whole thing's going to blow up in 10 minutes because the way he or she is running up and down the hall or firing off all these baloney emails, which are just riddled with constant frustration and disappointment. Like this is a sinking ship. So authenticity, vulnerability, being transparency. real, transparency, you know, being transparent, that's what's going to get your, your team and your employees to buy in and to go all in when, when they know that, that you know, you're not just uh, robotic and, and, the, you know, it's affecting everything. And, and that gives them the opportunity to step up because people want to help. They, they want to create a solution. They, they care about their job. Most of them and if not, then they're probably not a good fit, but you know, if you're, if you're finding the right, uh, the right fit for your team and culture, then that authenticity can go a long way. Namali, you're a number one Amazon bestseller. Um, you've got uh, multiple books uh, out there, entrepreneurs in an entrepreneur's world, the 66 day law firm turnaround. Obviously you've helped a lot of, you know, law firms over the years. Don't be a yes chick, I think was your first one. Tell us about your latest book uh, that's coming out. Yes. I'm really excited about it. I haven't written a book since 2008, came out in 2009. And um, I just have a strong calling for this, especially since uh, coming off the past uh, two years or so. Oh, the title gosh, is Fix My Employees, um, because this is the number one subject matter that I get in email, phone, text, you know, DM messages, what have you. When people feel like that is the greatest need that the entrepreneur, business owner, manager need is to fix their employees. But the sneaky thing that I'm playing with right now is that in parentheses, it's going to have ER, fix my employer. And the whole premise of the book fix is myself. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So go the coach. So go the coach E. So it's a two-sided relationship, not a one-sided relationship. So my greatest hope, like anything that I do, my podcast, blogs, books, is that it's a body of work that actually will resonate and that can be picked up and used and kept off the shelf for both the employee and the employer to get them on the same playing field. And my unwavering commitment is really to transform that employee-employer relationship once and for all. Mm. Well, I mean, for most of us, for me, I could tell you it's it's my biggest uh, uh, biggest asset. It's also you know the biggest expense usually. I mean, a lot of uh, you know expense goes to paying great people to do a great job, and and so the more that we can you know create an environment for them to succeed, that's what's going to help us to succeed. So it sounds like it starts with fixing ourselves as as the owner, as as the employer, giving them the right atmosphere, and then. And then take the next step. How, where can, when's this book coming out? How can we, you know, pre-register to get a copy? How does this, how can we do this? Yes, absolutely. Easiest way to stay connected and find out published date right now. My uh, goal is to launch it before July 1st. Um, just okay. finishing the final touches on that. And um, just go to my website, hiringandempowering.com. Opt in, drop a fresh blog um, every Thursday brand new podcast every um, Tuesday. And as always, my messaging and my tonality and my deliverability is always for the employer, the employee, and then together. Amen. Well, well said. Well, guys, again, go to www.hiringandempowering.com. That's hiringandempowering.com register to get a copy of a book that's going to absolutely pay huge dividends for helping you to build your business. 
And more importantly, there's a lot of tools. There's a lot of you know, different information, her podcast, her blog on there, that's going to help you as a manager, as a business owner, as an entrepreneur, to really create that culture, connect with your team at a different level and create all types of, you know, just better relationships. Uh, I like uh, I like in Ray Dalio's uh, book, Principles, where he talks about having meaningful work and meaningful relationships. Mm. There's nothing more meaningful than the relationship you have with your team and, and how you treat them and the lives and opportunities you're able to, to change doing that. Molly, it's been amazing having you as a guest here on the Seven Figures Club podcast. I would like to have the final word be yours in terms of, you know, the most important actions that we can take today um, to really connect with our employees and team and, and understand, you know, that it starts with us. You know, I would say, again, I think in a nutshell is just realizing you're hiring human beings versus human doings, first and foremost. And it's a relationship. It's not a transaction. So the second you can shift that from a place of resentment to excitement and really spending, giving your employees time, attention, feedback, and connection. And simply, you know, they're maybe depending on your culture and how you manage and lead right now, they might not quote unquote, trust it in the beginning. They want to see proof of concept. They want to see this consistent yeah. and persistent and not just this fun little thing that you've learned on a podcast or at a workshop that you have to do, which has some backhanded, you know, um, agenda that's going to increase your revenue. You know, you have to really come to it from a place of transparency and authenticity. And one question that you can even start with and keep asking it until you get people to open up is, what is it that you're not seeing in your job, in our culture, in our business that you would really like to see and then be quiet. Mm -hmm. And if people don't talk or they give you one word answers, that'll be a very strong clue that you have a lot of work to do to really make it a safe place for people to speak their truth. If people are dumping everything in the kitchen sink don't get overwhelmed and don't freak out that, oh boy, problem city. No, it is a beautiful thing because you have created a, you know, persona and an environment that really tells people, I really care. I really want to hear your opinion and they feel safe. So if they just start open the floodgates open, take it as a celebration, then you can figure out what to do with the content. Amen. Well, what, what a powerful message, Molly. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. Again, guys, it's hiring and empowering.com. Make sure you go check it out and learn from great people like Molly. Don't just take this information and say, oh, that's great. Take action. Go to the website, invest some time, you know, invest the effort that it takes to get to the next level and join the seven, eight, nine figures club in the future. Molly, thanks for being a guest. Thank you for having me. Are you looking for more seven-figure secrets, content, or even how you can launch your own recession-proof business? Then check out sevenfigures.com. That's the digit seven, F-I-G-U-R-E-S.com, where we share more videos, stories, strategies, funding solutions, entrepreneurial education, and even the secret business type that's recession-proof. Thank you for listening, and if you're finding value in our podcast, please give us a five-star and invite others to join the club.